I'm Mark Z, and you're watching Thorin, the best interviewer behind Travis Gafford. Right, this is going to be another episode of Elitists United. Our guest for this episode, returning guest, is Young Buck. Obviously, he knows what it's like to live in a world where something's going around. You know, it, it's making the atmosphere very uncomfortable. People are looking at each other nervously, thinking, is, is, is that the guy to blame? But enough about Fnatic last year. <laughs> obviously, he referenced it. No, obviously, formerly of Fnatic, now happily of XL. Borderline playoff team. <laughs> Hopefully, does better in the future. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm not, we're not going to blow smoke up your ass for Young Buck. It's just an all right team at the moment, but you do what you oh, can. That's fair. fair. Do what you can. Right, okay. Let's actually start with Excel because obviously there's a lot we can jump into here. Yeah. So what I wanted to ask is this. We should do a little bit about Fnatic and then go into all the stuff with Excel. So can you tell us now, with some distance from your time at Fnatic... Give us some. Give us some insight as to what would your version be of why you're now an XL coach as opposed to still being a Fnatic coach this year or something. What would you say at this point in time? Uh, I would still have to be very political, I'd say. So okay, I, I, I mean, <laughs> fair I, enough. I'm, I'm just honest that I yeah, got a full honest answer. Um, just the lineup was not working. Everyone was fighting with each other, and I thought at a time it required three or four roster changes for it to work. For there to be people playing with each other that wanted to okay. play with each other. So, and it was really unlikely to happen. So, that's why I'm here now. But I would say that it seems like at least they're doing better now. I, I don't hear too much rumblings within Fnatic. There were a lot of rumblings at the start of the season, but they're winning and doing well. So, that usually helps. Does that, without making it too far the other way, does that imply to you that... Not that you were a problem, but that you, that your presence was part of the issue and that you actually being removed from the equation has maybe resolved something or they've gone a different direction with something. What would you say on that? No, I, I think so, yeah. I think in general, every team should have at least two roster changes a year or like big changes to not get complacent. And I think in this case, it was Proxa and all of the staff. So analyst, head coach, assistant coach, manager, team director all got changed. I think yep. that's a big enough change for... Yeah, the place not to get too complacent or known to each other. Okay, well, let's dive into this then, because that's actually a topic that Veteran is a big proponent of as well. Like, he actually thinks, for example, that's one of the reasons why the G2 role swap was a good idea, because the idea is you don't want the team thinking at the end of last year, like, well, we won every match except once, all we do next year is the same, and at the end we win the next match. It's like, that's not going to work. You have to start over again, don't you? You have to get your motivation back, start yeah. at square one, you have to win the split again. Like, like, there's a reason why a lot of teams get to finals or win championships and never get back there again. So what's your take on this, Veteran? Like, what, it's, you are, you've had a similar theory, right? That you should do. Yeah, it's worth doing something just to make the team have to like force them to adapt, right? And some of the basis of it was trying to answer why SKT was so yes. dominant for so All long. The right? and, they and, had, yeah. and the big thing is that they basically always swapped around jungle, uh, jungle top, uh, top support. They always had two roster changes a year, like Young Buck is saying, uh, and this created such dramatic shifts in the environment that none of the players could ever get complacent, and complacency does kill competitivity over time like you do need to kind of remain on edge you do need the adrenaline rush kind of artificially inserted into you you do need to feel like everything is not optimal right now because that encourages you yourself and gives you yourself the motivation to keep improving yourself it doesn't allow you to get comfortable with the way things are now because that's when other teams can come in look at what you're doing figure out why that's bad and then come in and sweep you right like Fnatic were actually very close to defeating G2 uh, at the end of last year in the summer finals you know if g2 remained complacent and didn't keep trying to create problems for themselves to solve you know and keep a dynamic flow in that regard then it very can like they could actually have just come into this split losing like we've seen so many other dominant teams do when they haven't had a roster shift because teams do just get figured out they eventually will keeping the environment dynamic is the way that teams keep ahead of everyone else because there's not just a definite article there for you to explore and destroy the next season Okay. Young Buck, give, give us some more thoughts on this, because I know, for example, in my own native game of Counter-Strike, this is definitely a factor, even though people haven't like necessarily formalized it like you guys have. So if a team's a great team and they're on top and they fall off, they would often keep the lineup together, that one, for way too long, because they just keep thinking, like, oh, something will change, you know, we'll get back whatever we had. But it nearly always does take a roster move to take you back to the top again. So is this kind of like that principle where... 
when people complain about practice in LCS in NA, for example, they're always like, you know, the quality of the scrims is so bad, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, in an abstract sense, that shouldn't matter. You should still play the scrim as though you were playing at Worlds and you're playing as properly as... But, but you just know human nature means people are going to probably sink to the level of the competition. Is it something similar to that? Like, you kind of need to almost create an obstacle to stop people just imagining there are none? Yeah, I think the two hardest times in my entire career was shortly after MSI 2000, I think 17, where we made the finals. So yep. the team reached his goals, stuck together, then had a horrible start to the summer because just the motivation was really low to play in the LEC, um, still EULCS at the time. And uh, there were no changes whatsoever. So everyone just uh, in the team expected there to be results. And the second one was after 2018 World Finals. We also had only one roster change. And it was very similar. There was very low amount of motivation and effort being put into actually getting results. And then I think we started split one and five in the first four weeks, three weeks. Yeah. It's just it, it just seems that when a team reaches its goals and doesn't make any changes, then it almost yeah. always dooms. And I thought that was gonna happen to G two as well. So maybe the roster change was a was a good way to tackle that. Yeah. The role swap. In I mean, they have looked more cool. vulnerable this year. Like, they have looked more vulnerable this year uh, than they did in previous years. And not like they look like in summer form, but I do think the roles sort of prevented them uh, becoming a team where quite clearly they're not going to be first or something like this, you know? Like, it at least prevented that. But they have shown vulnerabilities. So. Yeah, I think it's relatively safe to say they've downgraded both their positions this year. <laughs> well, that's and, true. Uh, yeah. Me and I think it, still me. Think, yeah. <laughs> no, I still think Perks is the best mid laner in Europe, but mm -hmm. still, it's to me, it's a downgrade in uh, mid lane and it's still a downgrade in AD carry. Yeah, I don't disagree on that one. Right, what about the coming into XL then? Because obviously people know it's not like XL's expectations are the same as Fnatic's when you're in the team or G2, where the expectation is to be the best, to win the league, to go to Worlds, etc. Like, this is a team where I think most people's pre-split expectations were, like, just making playoffs would actually be considered good with this roster. So even though at the moment you're just outside of the playoff spot, I actually think if you look at the number of games won, some of the teams you won those games against, and then how competitive the teams above you are, I don't think that Actually, even though you've not yet secured a playoffs, but this this seems like it's, it's going pretty well. Um, yes and no. I mean, we have been officially eliminated from playoffs um, since last week. I would say that in most seasons, if you went into the last week having seven wins, you would still either be in playoff contention or in, be in a really decent yes. position to make it. Normally, right? yeah. normally, I think yeah. there was I think there was some stat like only one team ever that had eight wins didn't make the playoff. I think it was like Optic or something a couple of years back. So I think I think it, it's normally the magic number, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's somewhere between seven and eight. So, um, so that's a very unfortunate. But I also think that we just. Did, we had some weaknesses that we didn't overcome, and they were just killing us against a better opposition. But even then, you know, every, you need a little bit of luck. Um, there's a world in which we would have had a good dive against Misfits, uh, had a six, seven k gold lead at like 14 minutes and won the game, but we missed the dive, and now we're 100% out of playoffs. But had we actually landed that one dive, for example, had been a little bit luckier, we would have actually had the head to head to Misfits and be an even footing now. So it's a little bit of luck, but I still ultimately we really had a few games that we should have won what do you i think mean i mean yeah i mean um i was in a similar position um in uh 2018 um in the swing split there where we came into the last week knowing we had to win those two games to make it into playoffs um and always in my head i was thinking if we lose either these two games and that was a horrible week by the way because we couldn't even scrim because two of our players had fevers that whole week so we came in not really knowing what the new meta was because it was a new patch as well and we just picked swain and then we picked sign and nivia but anyway i knew if we lost these games i'd either have to blame the fever and stuff or i'd spend the whole time thinking to myself well what if versus unicorns we actually went in on the fight patrick said to go in on and then was called off by another player like if we'd done that we 100 percent win the game there and then and stuff like this like i i knew all of those things were coming to my head but ultimately off that the way i would kind of counter that is like i know it would come into my head but 
what I should be thinking is, what did I get wrong at the very start of the split or even in the off season or whatever that got us in a position where we are thinking we have to win these games coming into this weekend, right? Because there are like other issues that are kind of preventing you guys being that like definite mid-tier team or a contester for a top-tier team. And if you were currently one of those, you wouldn't be coming to the final weekend like that, right? Um, so I would say like you could you can you can put it down to luck, but there are probably other areas to look at, right? And that's that's generally how I kept myself sober right but oh, instead of going into that yeah it's 95 percent that we weren't good enough and then five percent yeah every now and then you need you need to win a best of one that you shouldn't win or you should yeah. Won yeah 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 i mean but your then, case yeah. it's it's literally that that young buck right because your team was incredibly <laughs> consistent in that you beat all the bad teams below you and then you just lost to all the good teams above you so all you needed to do was nick like you said just one best of one might have done it absolutely and in the first half we had we had like four or five losses that were extremely close as well. So, but then again, you know, we just weren't good enough to actually uh, kill the enemy nexus. All right, let's just jump straight into having some fun with some of the XL players because one <laughs> name, right, that if you even dare to mention on this show, <laughs> react just. It brings the worst and the best out of veteran is Nikki <laughs> because listen, everyone knows already veteran is like he, he's basically like the anti LS. Like he hates Koreans and he definitely hates <laughs> imported Koreans. Like unless we're talking about like literally bringing Faker over or something, LS is um, veteran rather isn't on board like by default. And in the case of Mickey, obviously Mickey already has some baggage with all the shit that happened in NA, and then people like he's basically. He's being branded as like a coin flip mid laner at this point in time. That's what people think of him. How, how does how does Mickey's coach see him? Like, how was working with him? What what? How do you perceive him as a player, and how you how do you use him in your team? I think he is extremely uh, proficient in mechanics. I think he's one of the better mechanical mid laners, and has a pretty wide champion pool. Um, I think he's really clever, but one of his issues is that for, for him, English is not like a second language yet. So for him to process information from teammates or to give information to teammates in a clutch situation is very difficult. Um, but how, how do I use him? I think he's very flexible, actually. He likes to play tanks. He likes to play AD carries. Uh, he likes to play mages. So it's, it's, that's not really a, a big issue. I just think he's really mechanically gifted. So putting him on mechanically intense champions are better than putting him on Ornn, which also happened and didn't work so well. I mean, putting him on Bane also happened and that didn't work out very well in a matchup that was incredibly favorable to him in one-on-one -on -one isolated scenarios. So yeah. I plead the fifth on that game. Yeah, you're going to have to plead the fifth on that. You're going to have to plead yeah. the fifth in the Fnatic game this weekend as well, um, where he also was getting solo killed by Nemesis. Um, you're going to have to plead the fifth on a ton of games, to be honest. Like, he had one really standout game on the Pantheon one, and even then, most of the work was done for him on the uh, warding scenario there. Like, they're literally backing in an area that they had no clue was warded. That Well, actually, honestly, Madline should have fucking known that. Um, but, but even then, he wasn't ever able to carry through any sort of early game advantages, even if his team had gifted them to him into mid to late game um it like actually you, you were never able to close out games sometimes due to composition sure which is a different thing but he has never been like the hard carry of the team even when he has got ahead like for example that pantheon game right kind of couldn't find the words quite quite right to say it but this isn't a guy where it seems like if you throw all the resources on him even though you say that he is mechanically insane that he is able to output a severe amount of pressure on the side lane versus other players who aren't necessarily in the lec right now like leader proved that they were able to do against the top teams and the reason why i kind of as a default don't like imports is because when i see players like mickey consistently fail to output side lane pressure on side lane mechanically intensive champions even when they've been gifted a lead i always think about the players in europe that haven't been given the same opportunity for whatever reason because the statement that is being made is that no one in europe can do that position instead and that's just an absolute falsehood like we saw leader do that against fanatic last year and against splice last year over and over and over again and if you're looking for a mechanically intensive player there'll be one there if you're not looking for that but you are looking for a consistent player zazi is still out there right there are plenty of mid lane like obviously i could name a ton of other mid laners as well right and for me there are plenty of situations where mickey's in where i think if any of these guys when I don't see why they wouldn't be carrying in a similar scenario. Even on your own academy team in Fnatic, like Magic Felix is known as an incredible side laner and a ton of setups that he put Mickey on. And I could see him doing a lot better in those situations. So, Yeah, I don't think it's a question of whether there are or aren't players in EU. When I came in, Mickey's contract ran out, so we were looking at mid lane options. Yeah. And from the options available and the information that I had, because I also checked, of course, with Expect and Kdrobo, we were still staying around. 
they gave really high recommendations to try to sign Mickey on because they had them, held him in very high regard, so very good uh, game knowledge, very good mechanically, whatnot. So I checked out all the other candidates, and it was also pretty clear to me that Mickey was just the standout performer out of those. By did the I way, check well, all of your names? No, I did not, but I, I checked about four or five people. When we had Fevervan on the show, I think off the top of my head, like three or four weeks ago, oh, God. He, he actually picked up <laughs> Mickey and was saying he thought he was really good. And some of the similar things you were saying, right? Is the implication that is, is Mickey like a scrim god or something? Why, why do other people have such a high regard for him, do you think? I think in general, we are our team has a uh, uh, scrim got uh, thing going. I think we've performed worse on stage than in scrims, so there's definitely something to be said for that. Um, I have to ask them because we did see some teams like Schalke. I'm probably going to isolate at some point in this uh, show as being a team that highly benefited from moving the whole thing online. Obviously, none of what we really saw outside of maybe G2 versus Rogue looked like a scrim at all, right? But shouldn't mickey be benefiting from an online environment then this weekend and we still didn't see him step up in the way that so many people including you right now have picked him up to i think the pressure of knowing that we had to win was big enough for the online thing not to matter i would say um and especially against Fnatic, we took them really seriously like that was the game that we thought we, we had a decent chance of that winning just because we have my inside knowledge on how to draft against them um against g2 we just went Everything out, everything in the kitchen sink out of the window. I don't know what the correct uh, way of wording it is, but that was uh, that was correct. Yeah, okay. That's not a game to really review and try to get sure. uh, some macro points out of. We went yeah. into the game literally <laughs> before before the game. We said, guys, we're all going ten zero, or we're all going zero ten. But <laughs> um, okay, yeah. So that was the mindset. But yeah, against Fnatic, it wasn't a great right. show. I, I do have to say then on that, saying that you went into that particular game with the mindset that you're going 10 0 or 0 10, um, I have to ask. I'm not saying that like I I I I lost a significant amount of money or something, but there have been multiple points in the split where post draft I have run into financial concerns after after certain events happening in game, namely to do with one other player that isn't Mickey. But basically, I accept that way back in the day, when you got him on G2, all right, Expect was really well known for his Rumble and his Renekton, right? Like, and you even brought him on, in my understanding, and you maybe could correct me on that, in part because you could play these carry kind of champions that kickers at the time couldn't. Um, right. I accept that. Um, however, um, every time that you guys lock in Renekton, but the rest of your composition looks really lit to me, I still tend towards the composition because composition should be really good. And then what happens is that Expect's doing really fine on Renekton, and then Mickey's gotten solo killed again for some reason. Norskeren's trying to prove I will dominate correct for this game for some absurd reason. Like, it's a coin flip there, it's not every game. Um, and, and, you know, everything's going to shit. And I'm just thinking, and, Expect is on Renekton, but Gangplank was open the entire time, and I've seen him do really good games on the Gangplank. You seem to lock yourselves into a lot of compositions where you don't have that scaling option later on in the game, and you have to close out by like a 25 minute mark. For example, infamously, like the Zaya Rakan game that you guys played, I think it was against Fnatic, it was against the top team, and you 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 had to close that one. Actually, it was, it was Zaya Rakan LeBlanc versus uh, Fnatic, I think, right? Um, and you had to close that one by like 20. 25 minutes and then you weren't able to close it and then they just came back from inhibitors and 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 were able to win the game but you locked yourself into a lot of compositions where you guys have to close by a certain time without that much backup it's a bit annoying due to other financial reasons i just kind of want you to explain why you keep going into this given that expect quite clearly can also play gangplank right i think that's more um player preference that he okay. prefers ranked on a lot more um, I've also started to realize, especially this week, that it's uh, it's home conversation. I would have also preferred Gangplank, and maybe now with the Borg changes, Rankton is actually becoming much more meta. But uh, I think it's mostly player preference and wanting to play a more early game to mid game style. So, do you not override players in that regard then? Because there are some coaches that will override the player in that situation. There are other coaches that would just like prefer to fit it into the player's preferences, so to speak. It depends on the situation of the player. Um, in this scenario, mm -hmm. I felt like giving him a confidence, a champion that he's confident on was more important than giving him the right champion. Okay. All right. Sure. Okay. All right. I, I disagree with that kind of philosophy. Um, but yeah, I, I guess I understand now why things were going on in the draft that they were. Because I, yeah. yeah. 
I, I would have voted with him for Gang Plank in a lot of those scenarios. I when you say that, though, veteran, yeah, like like in this particular case, you're saying that you actually know that I expect can play Gang Plank, so it's not like he's just never played I mean, the champion was, and you force him onto it. We've seen him do it on stage as well. Like they sure. have picked Gang Plank before, and they've had like in that Pantheon game, it was expect that was really the carry. Like a lot of people focused on the two kills Mickey got early, but expect's pressure was and and he played that really fucking well. Was actually what ended up winning out the the game in turn. Um, obviously, it wasn't like the sole reason they won, but he was, in my opinion, the biggest reason why they won. And, and Pantheon became kind of a bridge towards Expect's Gangplank in that regard. And frequently, uh, you'll see stuff like Draven and Renekton on the same composition. And it's like your only bridge now is mid-jungle. And we all know that kind of betting on at least one of those two players doesn't work out. So, you know, you end up losing that bridge and, and then everything kind of goes to shit, right? Like, why? What, if you're going to have stuff like Draven on the bot side, why not have stuff like Gang, Gangplank on the top side play super hard to the Draven? and then you know play play to bridge towards those later on scaling champions and allow mickey to play utility for that like those are those are the, that's the kind of like issue that i have right now because they try to play too much of this in like right, in the draft that all makes sense what you're saying but the point i was going to bring up was kind of what he touched on at the end there which is if yeah. the player himself doesn't necessarily want to play the champion even if it is right for the composition how do you where do you come down on that veteran because you're saying like well, i was just overruling but it's like it, doesn't that just give the yeah. player like a get out of jail free card where he can then just lose the game and then be like, well, I didn't want to play that champion anyway. And it's like, so this is, what do you say yeah. in that scenario? You know, This is obviously anecdotal, but for me, my bigger regrets have always been when I haven't put my foot down rather than when I right. have. Um, so maybe, maybe that's anecdotal, but I've definitely had a lot more success by telling some people to shut the fuck up and just blame me after the game. But it is sweet. I can already right, tell you like, right now, because I can remember on past shows that Young Buck somewhat agrees with you. Because from what I remember, he said power. he's had some scenarios where he said he regretted yeah. like letting a player pick a champion. Because you just do it because you think you want him to be confident, right? Like you were saying, Young Buck. Yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah. I actually, I, I agree with Fetron and I would take his route 95% of the time. Just not when I'm about to bet money. <laughs> 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 Right. What do you think, by the way, if we make it, before we dive into these specific teams, uh, just yeah. quickly, what do people actually think uh, the effect has been of playing the L LEC games online versus offline in a studio with all the interviews and all the, all the other jazz that goes around? Like, has it affected much the games? Yeah, I think, yeah, it's just, it feels less professional. We're sitting here with uh, laptops that have cameras on them, uh, acting as cameras for the referee and... Everyone is basically able to cheat if they want to, but of course they won't. Um, <laughs> I'm just throwing out there, you know. Um, that's one way to say it. I like that. I See, I told you, that's the one thing I actually appreciate veteran about living in the Netherlands is like the Dutch are just incredibly blunt. I like it all. It's like, it's my style anyway, you know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, a year ago, one of my staff members had a great idea. It's a fun idea that you could just put buzzers in people's shoes and uh, left foot is uh, the enemy jungler's bot side and the right foot enemy jungler's top side. Um, it but would yeah, work. The sad thing is, by the way, jokes aside, that is a real thing that would work because back in the day in Counter Strike, there are actually some like semi pro level teams who cheated exactly like that. You know, like in Counter Strike, if you're on the CTs and they're going B and rushing it, then someone sends you a text message, your phone vibrates in your pocket, and you know they're going B. Like that actually would work, Jeez. sadly. It's just hopefully nobody watching this actually listens to what we're saying because you could definitely implement this, unfortunately. Just please don't do it. Don't ruin the whole game for everyone. <laughs> no, I think there's enough trust between the teams and for players not wanting to ruin their career and staff members from making sure it doesn't happen. Um, which is also what Ryder said, like, hey, we just hope you guys don't cheat. Okay. What's, that, what's that 100% it. going to happen now is that those metal detectors that they give you are now going to go all the way down to the foot. They're not going to half ass it after, <laughs> after they see this episode. Yeah. I, I sometimes wonder if they even work. I've never seen them go off. But, yeah. True. Actually, no, they went off for me once, um, but it was a pen, so it was fine. Ah. But yeah, I, I think it has changed a bit. I mean, it, it probably depends on the team, but it doesn't feel that uh, prestigious anymore. It doesn't feel very serious or professional. Sure. Like, if I give you an example, like, one of the results that when I saw it on paper, when I was busy doing something else, when I saw that Schalke beat Misfits, the problem is I have to think to myself in my brain... Does any of that have to do with it being an online game? We'd already heard the past, mm. like Shark is maybe better in scrims. Like, what do you think? Um, I think Misfits is on the decline. I mean, I had some inside information that apparently things aren't running very well over there, but uh, I don't know what is actually going on. 
and then they lost to Mad Lions, ruined their playoffs run, and uh, then they lost to Shock on top of that. Not not surprising. Or do you make of this faction the Misfits decline? That's really surprising. Misfits had a really strong start, and then they just like declined, declined, declined to the point where XL could have even tiebreaked versus them eventually. If only someone could have predicted that at the beginning of the season. But it's going exactly as I thought it would for them. But on the Shulker side of things, I do think that uh, Shulker did get a boost from it being online play. That was one of the predictions I made going into this uh, week, particularly, was that Shulker would look a lot stronger. The immediate takeaway from Shulker um, is that Lurox looks so much more comfortable in an online setting than he ever has in an offline offline one in an offline one he he you would never see such aggressive pathing from him in offline and the first instance that we saw of this um outside of prime league obviously was when they did the in-houses for the uh for the weekend where they couldn't do any lec at all and you could see lox was already far 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 more aggressive even though we also found that whippo would actually be like a top five jungler if he started playing jungle in the lec right now um but we saw this continued, like the, the full clear of Red Buff side into immediate invade of Red Buff side for Gragas, knowing Gragas is going to do full clear of Blue Buff side instead, and then the balling back to his camps, and then on the reset going straight top side for a secondary invade. We would never see something like that from Lurks beforehand. I could I could literally, twice was the amount of times I'd seen Lurks do something pre-eight minutes um, before before the games this weekend. And this weekend, it was kind of like the skill boost that we saw Razork have after the first two weeks, except obviously there's an environmental change this time to account for it rather than well obviously he's being coached by like a former jungle main um a former jungle pro player uh, and obviously the coaching is kind of kicking in now like with lorox we see an immediate degree of comfort levied to him here that we didn't see beforehand abadage looked a bit better not like miles better but abadage did look a lot more decisive than he has beforehand uh, and you saw you saw all that coming out here um, Inax obviously looks a little bit better as well, but that, I was kind of a bit disappointed that we didn't see a skill boost from Bevoy in that regard because obviously Febivan had also bigged up his teammate, right? Um, so it's like maybe this guy's just a fucking god in scrims, so I'm just not seeing it, but instead we, we didn't really get to see much. That being said, Loox did split the map uh, in favor of bot side that game, so what, what the hell is Bevoy going to really do in that point? He's going to be behind for the rest of the game. Um, but yeah, I do think I do think that that may have cost Misfits that win. But I was I was I was expecting to see more losses from Misfits anyway. Outside of this weekend, we'd seen Misfits on the decline regardless. Um, so it's not really unexpected in that regard. It's just less expected that Schalke would ever have a two zero week versus any teams. To be honest, they literally doubled their wins this weekend. So, but it's it's kind of expected that Lurks would do better online. That the whole team is still adjusting to stage, you know? They've, they've been through more changes than anyone, and I don't envy that org at all right now. Was Razork overrated due to the couple of weeks he looked like you smurfing? No, he still looked good. He still looks very good. Um, it's just he was actually able to be matched by Lurox this time. I think he still looked really good in the last weekends as well. I don't actually think that that's where the problems are lying. I think where the problems are lying is on sideline. Like, people have figured out that Dan's not a very good laner. People have figured out that, well, everyone has already figured out that the bot lane was actually open to to, to being pressured on. And this weekend, I don't think Febivan have figured out that Azir was good into Orn, which is surprising given that he would default to Azir a lot of the time anyway. Uh, so they kind of lost out on midsection that pressure got transferred to one of the very vulnerable side lanes and so the moment Febivan the rock is out of the game like it's very easy to attack misfits I, I want I, I don't know maybe Joey has like a different take on misses but for me their side lanes are kind of weak so if you are able to take down midsection it's actually fairly telegraphed how you beat that team yeah I can go a little bit deeper into misfits um, because I have something controversial to say I think they Ooh. are the team with the best macro in Europe when they are ahead. I just think they really struggle getting ahead, and I think the drafts are below par. Um, but definitely weakness in the bot lane. I, uh, when I scout them, I can tell they're, uh, the jungle doesn't play much on bot lane, and it probably has a lot to do with communication issues. Um, sure. It doesn't help that there's a Korean player there that, that uh, doesn't speak a word of English, uh, supposedly. So they rely a lot on the solo lanes getting ahead early. But I think they have fantastic macro, and I can actually recommend teams to scout them and watch them and see what they do when they're ahead. It's just I actually, yeah. the draft go on, go on. and the bot lane early on is really holding them back. 
I actually don't disagree uh, on... I don't disagree on most of what you said. I would add in that I... Maybe your opinion on Dandan Dan is different to me, but my issue with Dandan Dan is where he's very good at playing a good weak side mid-game. I don't view him as a competent laner to anywhere near the degree of, like, any other top laner that you have worked with, for example. Um, I, I, I also view him as a weakness in that regard. I do think their macro is really good, and Febervin's going to take credit for that, so Febervin can continue to take credit from that. Um, but uh, I... I think that that doesn't really matter when you have like such glaring weaknesses that they do have. And I do think they have been being carried by Macro, but I don't think Razor's one of the glaring weaknesses to like bring it back to Foreign's original point. I think Razor's right. really fucking good. All right, being as you just played against Fnatic and it is your former team, and obviously most of the squad is the same that you changed up the jungler. Uh, what are your thoughts on Fnatic at the moment? Um, I think they're the best team in Europe right now. Um... I think just having so many changes improved them a little bit and G2 downgrading uh, also helped their case. So I think G2, I mean, Fnatic is looking like they're going to win the split. Um, what I noticed is that G2 is already, I think they cut the cord on playing 80 carries about a week and a half ago. They had the week where they played two Astral games and after that they've been going back to mages. Um, yeah, and no, we're going into the game and said, guys, they're not playing 80 carries bot lane. And it turned out to be true. And I think they're actually going to not play 80 carries bot lane anymore for the rest of the split because... I think the only way they can beat Fnatic is by either playing Mage's bot lane or playing something cheesy or winning the drafts in other ways where you have like Azure Yumi Janna running around and uh but how, how does that how does that work in a best of five? You can't do that. You can't pull it off five times, so I think they really need to beat Fnatic based on drafts and cheesy picks in the bot lane. Is the implication there that they've just given up on the idea Caps is gonna be a really good ADC player? Possibly, and maybe also Caps just knowing that he's a really good mage player and that he should be playing mages. At least to me, it looked like Caps on Aphelios and Misfortune wasn't really working. I know there's a few yeah. AD carries that he really likes. Um, so Ezreal is one of them. I think he's a Callista guy as well. I know he likes Draven. But the Aphelios Misfortune ones are the ones that didn't really seem to work that much. So it makes sense that they actually started banning Aphelios in most of the drafts and then moved on to a mage. Now, veteran, last year, Upset went to great pains to point out to me that actually even people like Perks didn't often play stuff that wasn't an ADC champion. Like, as much as they could occasionally play the Yasuo's, etc., most of the time he did still spam, like, Kaiser in the spring, like, Zyre in the summer. Like, he played just the strongest ADC champion. He just happened to be an ADC player, basically. Right? Yeah. I kind of agree with Youngbuck. Like, you can do it in certain spots. You can do these unorthodox bot lanes, but that yeah. can't be an entire strategy. Like, that can't just be all you're going to do from now on, and every game is going to be some variant of, like, a weird bot lane no one's played the 2v2 against. That surely can't work. I agree. Um, but what do you do in that regard, then? Because say that you do have five strategies, you can't ban five strategies per game, and you can't possibly game the draft to have a counter for no matter what of the remaining three strategies that you're going to come up against will be. Um, there is potentially a way that they can game this through. Um, it will be like something being telegraphed is only step one, right? It only really matters if something is telegraphed, if something is both telegraphed and highly counterable within either draft phase or in-game. Okay. I wouldn't necessarily agree that Everything that G2 do is very easily counterable either from draw phase or directly in game. Obviously, stuff like the Janna thing has just been patched out, sort of. People are actually making it work in solo queue, going Dawn's Ring and going into spell feats in 10 minutes, but um, but stuff like that has somewhat been patched out. Um, I I think that they are a lot more vulnerable to Fnatic than we've seen them. I kind of disagree with other people's assertions that the Fnatic game was at all that close. Um, I thought that the, uh, the second Fnatic versus G2 game that they did, uh, I thought that honestly, if you're G2 and you go back to the drawing board about what you do differently there, you literally just send Ezreal Yumi top instead of sending them back bot at eight minutes. Um, and if you do that, you're actually in the perfect way to immediately have tempo uh, in the opening phase of the game and Fnatic never get it back. Whereas if Fnatic go back to the drawing board and they notice the Ezreal Yumi swap to bot instead of top, um, then uh, then it's very difficult for them to figure what they actually do with their draft versus G2's draft, given that they won't have tempo anymore and given that that they 
percent did get outscaled in that. Um, so I actually think um, even on the close scenarios we've had here, I feel a lot more comfortable if I am G2 than if I am Fnatic. I do think Fnatic looks stronger than ever though, and I actually really want to ask Young Buck how much of this he thinks might be due to self-made being an upgrade over Broxer or if it is just on the mental reset factor. I think self-made is a kind of personality that fits really well with Nemesis because I think okay. that last year there was some kind of anti-synergy where both Nemesis and Broxa didn't like to tell each other what to do. They... No, yeah, I mean... <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be a weird problem to have. I don't think I've ever heard of that yeah. type of problem exists before, right? Yeah, but... If you're a mid laner, you sometimes need to tell your jungler, like, get your ass over here, push out my wave, or yeah. get your ass over sure. here, push in the wave, and we, we dive bot lane. And sometimes you need your jungler to tell your mid laner, dude, push in this wave and come with me, we're going to kill some people. Um, and that wasn't really happening. Both of them weren't proactively communicating with each other. So I think Broxa with Caps is a really good pair, because Caps is the one that will make action happen. And I think Selfmate yes. with Nemesis is a really good pair, because Selfmate is the one that's probably bossing Nemesis around in, the, in his way. So, in that regard, would it be that both people were trying to boss each other from day one on Nemesis plus Broxer, or neither were trying to boss each other on Nemesis neither. plus Broxer? Neither. 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 Okay. Just making sure that we're staying in line with like everything that we talked about before on the show then. So, yeah. given that, one of the... So, that was kind of the starting point, and... We kind of tried to go into it the last time that you were on the show, um, but you're so fanatic and you're a bit more political than you are right now about things there. So now maybe I can just straight up ask you, um, was it therefore um, the case that to get around that issue, Nemesis had to be the one to open up and start talking or that um, Brox had to be the one to open up and start talking? The political answer is it could be both and it could be. Okay. Really. I, mean, I mean, actually, I think... I think both should be doing it. I think both positions are I so agree. strong in the game. They need to both be pe bossing people around. They need to be bossing their supports around and each other. Those I are the agree. most important roles. So, yeah. I th yeah. so how did I'm it not... turn out? <laughs> yeah, so there, there's, there's no blame to either one of them. And we tried to make it work, you know, tried to make them both work better together. But it, it didn't. It just wasn't in the personalities and just didn't fit well. So I'm did trying to praise you, you here because for me... I had a similar issue with mid jungle and I could never figure out how to make it so that one of them would talk until literally everything was like, basically we were already fucked, right? It wasn't really until that level of desperation that one of them did actually step up in that regard. Um, but for me, like one of the most impressive things you're able to achieve as a coach on Fnatic is that you either got one of Broxer or Nemesis to talk and judging from everything that we have heard and that we see in game and that we see every time Fnatic release comes, it appears to be that you were able to make Nemesis into an incredibly vocal player that he would never was when Selfmade was uh, with him. So I don't know if you actually want to go in on that or not. If you want to just skip over that, sure. But honestly, like this is kind of something I want to talk about because Broxer just went and replaced X Smithy, and that team isn't doing so well. And a lot of people rightly say that's probably not Broxer's fault, but Broxer isn't going to be the solution to any of these uh, things. And one of the reasons I rated Broxer as lowly as I did beforehand was because Broxer was a cause of a lot of these communication issues on Fnatic. And it was quite clear to see that other people were doing parving. And now that I've seen Whippo actually play jungle, I, I'm starting to understand why certain splits were more successful than others for that iteration of Fnatic. Um, but yeah, like I, I really do want your take on this because it kind of it kind of matters a lot for a lot of the things going on right now. Yeah, because I, I don't think it's fair to throw Brox under the bus at all because he was sure. actually one of the most communicative team members in the early game. I think Nemesis was usually more the one opening up towards the mid to late game when it came to team fighting. And and that's just okay. the truth. Not being political, that's actually how it is. So sure. and I think Bipo is actually personality wise, he's a mid laner or jungler. And I also know that I mean, he could have ended up being the jungler for Fnatic this year. That was one of the options that was on the table. And that was actually one of the things that I told Fnatic you should make Bipo your jungler. And make him really? work well with Hillisa. What are the yeah. reasons why? Why is he more like a mid laner or a jungler to you? Well, he's he's just about everything other than a top laner to me because he wants he's really good at communicating, making creating opportunities, engaging, uh, making sure people end up in his lane, creating good situations. And usually the top laner is the one that should 
get the least amount of resources because they're just the least powerful role. Mm -hmm. So I think having him in mid lane, and we had a lot of scrims where we very were role swapping because of the matchups just being that way. Oh, okay. Having people in mid lane was really natural because he was always bossing people around and making things happen around him and moving around the map. Ah, it's just right. how he is. He, so you kind of got to test drive it when, because obviously if people don't remember last year, there was a lot of flex picks between top and mid. And so sometimes just yeah. if it's a bad matchup, you, you swap the lanes, right? So you kind of got to test drive this. It's not just a theory. No, it's not just a theory. So he was actually performing well in the mid lane when we were role swapping. And I just know that his personality fits really well with being a jungler yeah. as well. And he played a lot of jungle in solo queue at the time. So we talked about him jungling uh, in the future and whatnot. That's really okay. So, is that common for you of top laners, by the way, that the top laner's personality kind of fits more with mid jungle when you? No, I think for example, Soas no. is a perfect top laner in terms of his really? personality. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Let's see what else. I mean, I think Expect is also a good top laner. Yeah, they have good top lane personality. Sure. I've had a lot of top laners who have been so communicative, and uh, that I that I've felt the the need to kind of maybe recommend that they do swap to either mid or jungle because they will probably be better in those roles and generally the games end up getting better when you get to the mid to late game point where they can just boss around everybody right and then trying to unlock yeah. that earlier has been something I've found with a lot of tops I would have actually expected so as to be one of those um, on origin he wasn't really like insanely communicative in that regard but he does appear to at least nowadays be a guy who in mid to late game he kind of becomes the focal point of teams he's on but i don't know if that was just the case in misfits or if that happened in Fnatic as well no i think with Solus is more that he's extremely selfless so yeah. and that, that i think is really important for a top laner you need to be able to deal with scenarios where you're being thrown under the bus mm. and that was our uh our number one play style in 2018 so mm. was going to sit on his <laughs> tower and tp to bot lane whenever we needed him yeah. And uh, yeah, we also had to sometimes tell people, like, people, please stop telling your jungler that he can come top lane and get a gank. You know, <laughs> you need to go to the bot side of the map now. Uh, that's that's how it was. But yeah, he's always creating situations and fights. So I think he's just made for either jungle or mid lane. So. Right. Being as changing the jungler and especially the specific junglers here, going from Broxer to self made, would already impact the style of play a team would play with. Taking that out of the equation, do you get the sense? Is Fnatic a very different team to the Fnatic you had last year, to the way they play the game? No, I don't think so. I think they're playing the very, very similar style to last year. And now you're going to ask me, what is that style? Um, since last year there was a lot of anti-synergy between Brox and Nemesis, we had to do a lot of band-aids. So usually we'd have like a really good scaling jungler that didn't that had pressure from itself, like Cartus, Nocturne, um, or good team fighters. And we would either draft or we would draft like more Lee Sin and then really lo a good scaling mid laners, Vagar, come to mind Vagar, Azir, these kind of champions. And I still see Fnatic wanting to draft things like the the Orn mid lane, um, Vagar mid lane. You don't see him picking up LeBlanc now that he has a jungler that he feels more secure with, right? He's still not playing the Assassin, mm -hmm. so he's not playing Kiana either. He didn't play it in the start of the season. So I think their playstyle is still very much the same. Because if you notice, generally, it seems like most people are, are, are kind of off the Nemesis hype train. Like he was, a lot of people, Summer and going into Worlds last year, he was his peak stock, as it were. Like everyone was saying he was really, really good. Like it seems like this year, some of the, even though his team's doing very well, it feels like some of his flaws are a bit more apparent. Uh, I didn't I didn't really think, think about it. I still think he's a top three mid laner in Europe. Um are his flaws more apparent? Uh, sorry, I, I don't feel like I've watched enough footage of Nemesis to actually give a good uh, insight on that. I Not thought about it. Um, yeah, it's. Uh, I think it's just really obvious now to people that like Nemesis is kind of the player that he is with the pool that he is by choice um, to an extent. Like Young Buck is saying, it's very obvious to people uh, if somebody isn't picking LeBlanc when everyone and their mums is prioritizing it. Fnatic have to throw a ban on it instead or give Nemesis counter pick every single game. They don't have the flexibility in draft because of that. On red side, he is always the fifth pick. Um, he he has always tended more towards this kind of like passive scaling play style. His champ pool has always tended more towards that and the refusal to expand into uh, LeBlanc, Kian, 
Cristiano, even like Iredia. He paid lip service to Iredia in one or two games last year, and then never again. He's played one LeBlanc uh, competitive game his entire career, and then never again. Um, he's even picked up Keanu once and never again. But he's only paid lip service to these champions. He never actually actively expands to any of these kinds. It's very clear the kind of player Nemesis is now. Like uh, on the last episode, I said that there's probably a perfect player there if you merge leader and Nemesis together. Um, but we're probably never going to see that because both of these guys are choosing not to expand yeah. their pools and their play styles for whatever reasons. And honestly, given the, the system that Young Buck just said that they had, oh, sorry, that might be a trigger word. I mean, given the style that Young Buck said that they had last year, um, uh, it's probably perfect for him because Self Made absolutely loves those like heavy early game ganking junglers, right? So then, if they are still following that, then Nemesis, uh, Nemesis probably probably is in a, a very comfortable spot right now, right? He's probably in a very comfortable place. Yeah, I mean, part of why I said that before, Young Buck, like the idea that his flaws are more apparent is because if you think of the meta in summer last year, it was where everyone was just playing fucking cork in his ear every game. So in <laughs> some ways, masks the problem at that point in time. Like you think, oh, well, he's just playing his ear because that's what everyone's playing now. So right. it does look like the reason I find it confusing is I do think like it's obvious when you watch Nemesis play, he clearly has skills. Like his mechanics can be very good sometimes. Does he see the game differently than the way analysts and coaches see the game? How does it, how, what does he like as a mid in that sense no i think i think there's a lot of players that are in the camp play for scaling and have a better team fight or a better team and win that way um i think most the majority of players actually sit uh, f sit in that bubble um and i think that's a very easy strategy to go to when you're a top team and have really good teammates around you i think this strategy of nemesis will work domestically almost every time unless they face g2 then there might be some struggles but this will always work against an origin in the best of five or a misfits or a rogue so it's a formula for success that leaves very little windows to actually get exposed. Um, having said that, I don't know if it's because I know the players, but I feel like the easiest team to draft against is Fnatic because you know they're not playing LeBlanc. You're not, you know, there's no yeah. assassins coming. Um, I know that you know you can't give uh, Hillisung any thought to ever pick Rakan. If he locks in Rakan, you know the game is just over. So these are the little things to me that make drafting to them relatively easy but i don't know if there's having some inside knowledge or not that's actually um, another thing that i wanted to ask actually both of you about because it seems weird uh, is considering how many games fanatic has won if we combine last year's hillasang and the strength he had on certain champions with some of the like more borderline dodgy games he's had this year shouldn't he be basically one of the focal points of any ban strategy against fanatic because if you can get him onto certain champions it just looks like they become like half as good as a team yeah, I mean, I, last year I was always praying to the gods that they wouldn't ban out my support. Um, but that's just because Hilly Sang will win you games on three or four champions. If he gets them in a decent matchup, he will actually win you the game uh, alone. And this is also a strategy that we used last weekend. It didn't work at all, but we banned out the Rakan and then made sure that they couldn't pick an AD carry with a support that we know Hilly Sang works really well with. He mm -hmm. would want to put him on a champion like Nautilus or Tom usually. Um, I try not to get the thresh through, which he did end up getting, I think, in that game. Um, but yeah, I think I think it's pretty straightforward. Hilly Sang has three or four champions that he will win a game off of, and there's a few that he's a little bit more. He has a little bit more difficulty playing on them because, in his heart, he's an engaged player, and he's really good at seeing opportunities to engage and flank. Then again, he will also flank you with Tom Kench and not actually eat. Yeah, the, the joke is he also sees those opportunities when not playing champions. Yeah. I can do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, for, for me, the, the thing with Hillisang, and I kind of think the thing that you maybe slightly didn't address when Foran asked you is that whereas Nemesis does have that, and there are lots of players that do have that kind of idea that if we play for late game, like, you know, we'll, we'll win nine times out of ten, I'm not necessarily convinced that he's on a team full of players that believe that as well, and Hillisang is one of those players. Um, Hillisang is a guy who, when he was playing Nautilus in that Vega Gangplank comp, was just permanently going in, even though his job in that game is kind of just to sit on top of the Vega and the Gangplank while they control zones. He he got rid of those zones by crossing the boundaries every time. He's crossing the dematerialized zone and wondering why North Korea have put him in a camp now, you know? Like, that's the problem with Hillisung, in my opinion. And and I, and I that kind of de-synergy uh, is, is kind of the thing that I want to know from you. Do you think 
nemesis is on the team with people who agree with that kind of method to play the game because i see whippo going for it sometimes but even then whippo does like his lane dominance and whereas we maybe self-made is doing fine in those scenarios his champ pool at least his preferred champ pool even though calf is a big deal right now he hasn't really moved towards it right he's moved towards lee elise every goddamn game that he possibly can right and hillisang being the obvious one in that regard right so do you think nemesis is on a team of people who, who share his philosophy no no, no. <laughs> well, there you go. That was a short answer. Um, I appreciate yeah. <laughs> how absol absolutely absurd. And listen, I make a lot of ridiculous analogies myself, but the way veteran just slipped that in as though it was no big deal. To, like his analogy was just as always. As always, it's something that you always compare. Like it's like if you went across the demilitarized zone into North Korea and then got put in an internment camp. Like, oh well, that seems perfectly reasonable. Yeah, that happens all the time. <laughs> we, all, we all we all know what that's like, right? Like, what a mad analogy to slip it. It made sense. Like, listen, it was a good analogy, but fucking hell, the imagery was wild. I mean, it's just like that seems to me to be the biggest issue. Like, there are probably teams that Hillisan could be on with other players that he could be on and I'm not saying that you have to swap out them. I mean, G2 is an obvious example, right? G2 is an obvious example. Yeah, if you put Hillisang on there, I'm assuming that the amount of champions that suddenly you you would be afraid of Hillisang being on goes massively up because he's on a team that shares that philosophy and will share champions that spike at the points where he is going around the map trying to make shit happen, right? I'd assume there are other teams Hillisang would seem like more of a threat on, right? That's to you. Yeah, yeah that's fair to say. I also yeah. feel that somehow in this world there's... A there's a perfect anti-synergy that makes it really good because Bipo and Hillisang are actually the crazy people that want to fight a lot <laughs> and be very aggressive, whereas Reckless and uh, Nemesis want to do the scaling. So yes. how it felt to us when we were playing the games is that Hillisang and Bipo were kind of being the buffer um, yeah. and making sure they were getting the attention from the enemy and especially Bipo, you know, he he's under the enemy tower level two, if not level <laughs> one. Um, They'll make things happen, and in the meantime, Reckless and Nemesis, you know, they'll scale and then they'll outperform yes. most of it. It was kind no, of the, the, anti synergy yeah. that was really it was a big struggle, sure. but it came together in the end. Yeah, but that's the funny thing in the scenario you're talking about. It, it it's not anti synergy, is it? It's like it's like a balance of styles that makes the team more complete. If you had one or the other, like if you had a super passive team across the board. Reckless and Nemesis are just going to get attacked in the game. Like, it would be obvious what you do, but you're distracted by the fact that Hillisang and Whippo just go balls deep all the time. It's actually a pretty good mix if you think about it. Yeah, it is. See, they your bridge, you know? Just, just, just get one of those going on Excel and then you'll just win all the games, you know? I don't really view that actually as anti synergy. It just sounds to me like a bridge, like you basically just destroy the bridge. Where it becomes anti synergetic are times late game where Hillisang is still going in perma, right? That's kind of where it becomes anti synergy for me. Uh, but yeah yeah what about right we haven't got much time left on this one so how about this pick a team we haven't talked about yet we'll do that as the last topic who would be interested maybe Mad Lions do you want to do that yes that seems like a good team to talk sure. about right? unless he squad. desperately wants unless he desperately wants to do someone else I'd, I'd be unless a different team you have in mind no not at all okay right let's it's do Mad Lions then thoughts okay. veteran the problem is I I noticed the thing with Mad Lions is you don't want to go too far and make out like they're already like going to win the split because they clearly have some <laughs> key flaws. Yeah. But then even it's like I said the, when we had the Mad Lions players on the other week, it's like the really positive thing for me is even most of their losses have like some flashes where you're like they could have won this game or there was positives here. Like like the actual overall level of consistency seems pretty high. Yeah, um, and the biggest thing for me is how different they look to Splice last year. Um, in the sense that Splice last year basically just kind of like froze for like 5 billion years until Kobe got onto free items and then they would do something, but that otherwise they remained in this really weird 2-3 formation non-stop. And if you were yeah. an even vaguely good side laning team, you could always beat them. This iteration of Mad Lions seems to be addicted to contesting every single neutral objective possible on the map. And that's good. If they if if they're getting around that uh that 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 kind of like issue that they had where there was a massive period where they did nothing but stay in an uneconomic formation to get to late game where Theoretically, they'd be weak if the enemy team knew how to play. Um, if, if, if that's how they're getting around it, that's that's perfectly fine. Especially now, we're seeing a lot of souls kind of define the team that wins. So you can't really just wait to win anymore. But but they are starting to just contest every Drake, every Rift Herald, 
every uh, scuttle. And sometimes that plays out really, really badly if they picked a composition where they actually do kind of want to ignore neutrals until it's like third Drake, like that Victor game they played last week. This week, it worked out really well. Um, they've realized that they can pull off compositions like the Olaf composition with this in mind, right? Olaf Tarek, Olaf Trundle, uh, stuff like this, uh, with Senna being the buffer onto Olaf now, because they're playing for earlier spikes because these neutrals will give them the bridge towards the late game, right? Right? Um, and this is something we would never have seen splice last year, even vaguely attempt. And I actually really like it. It it, it seems a little bit um, simplistic, I guess, from them. But but considering the team that they were last year, it's actually massive. And the team the team themselves are clearly talented enough on an individual level to pull off these early game based champions. We're seeing the Callista type composition with the Olaf in the jungle. We'd never see Zerk C plus Kobe plus who was it? It was not Skaven last year. Yeah, pull that kind of uh, free man off. Uh, so 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 brilliantly in the early phases to secure them a 25 to 28 minute uh dragon soul but this team is doing that i think that's a really good style for them to continue uh honing in and now there's not a de synergy between their drafts and their style like there was the last weekend i i i i, I think the future looks really fucking bright for that team i don't think they're like the first place team but they are a team that could contest for third next uh next season you know what do you, you think young buck uh, well, I want to ask you. Mentioned something about a two-three system. Is that uh, yeah. common towards last year or this year? Because I noticed they're doing it this year, and I was really intrigued when I watched it. Yeah, they're, they're still doing it this year, but nowhere near to the same extent. And they'll shift into the 2 free specifically based around neutral objective. What last year's uh, Splice did was that they would always move into 0 2 free when they were in the lead, specifically so that they could always have a man advantage to force. So if you did end up trying to play the game out properly on free lanes, for example, versus them, they could immediately force on a late game winning spike and then win with numbers advantage still. Because theoretically, because they've been holding the situation the whole game, they'll still lose a 5v5 even though they're a late game team like is it, it's it's one that can be played around really easily um they are still doing it this year but they are doing that more relative to objective timers so they'll hold this 30 seconds before an objective is about to come up right and that's their way of getting around what they did in the first few weeks which was that they would walk in oink for 30 seconds and then leave to try to flank and then just lose all the control that they got 30 seconds before i think that's how they're kind of getting around it now um, but but last year they did nothing but this two free system nonstop. That was their default. I just think that's something that they're moving away from now. Okay, because I noticed they were doing it quite a few times, and it was actually this, but it was the first time I noticed any team doing that. Really? Um, Wait, hang on. Yeah, I, have, I mean, it I, could be me. I, I have to. I have to then just say, you guys always, as a backup plan, when you were behind on Fnatic went into a 2-3 system and a very specific 2-3 system where you had Nemesis on the utility champion behind Whippo all the time while Whippo was like hard shoving out a lane and you kind of just fog of ward Nemesis to try to force on that lane. Like you always did 2-3 in that regard. So I would have thought yes. you'd have noticed the 2-3 first. No, no, no that, that, that is a late game play. That was a set play. Yeah, um, yeah. I agree. But I've just noticed that Matt Lyons does this around 10 minutes into the game and what's fascinating yeah. is that Usually, when you're trading sides, there's always a yeah. weak side that catches the wave under either after yes. the tier one is down or like deep under the tier two, and they just completely abandon this idea and they just trade yeah. towers left and right, and that's very yeah. different than other teams. So they don't have a weak side because there's just no one on that side, yeah. and then it's... they have a really strong strong side. So I actually agree with them in certain instances of that, so long as they are picking like the Olaf Tarek uh, compositions and stuff, because if they're doing that, that singular tower that you're getting, uh, the tempo that you're getting from that and trading for the economy of the Drake is actually well worth it for a team that's going to get outscaled, but will still beat you on spikes right now. The additional gold you're getting from that one particular tower is not going to be enough for you to be able to contest them on that wave if they play heavy to it on the reset, right? So they theoretically can get tempo back that way unless you're very very strong at juggling all of the tempo yourself but even if you are there's there's there, there, there ends up being like it, it you're able to play an early game composition the way that mad lions are where the enemy team now has a time limit to beat you because you're the ones that are going to be willing to sacrifice your tempo for the soul every time right that doesn't yeah. ne that never existed last year that, that never existed last year but that does exist now for this um it's kind of like what happened with Origin versus G2 in the finals of Spring Split last year, but as if it was actually beneficial for Origin to do it, 
right? Um, where they kept giving up tempo to G2 to go for every fucking Drake, and then they lost the game off that. Um, but instead, this time, it actually works out because you can get the 28-minute soul, and the small economy that you get from those towers is not enough for you to win the contests on the 25-minute for the soul, right? So it yeah. only works out of that, and because they can still force tempo back in because they have an earlier scaling composition at that point. So in, in that regard, it kind of works, but that's like one patch away from getting destroyed. Right, um, if Riot decide to reshift the damage on dragons around the MSI patch, which they normally do do something around neutrals on the MSI patch, then suddenly that whole thing gets destroyed. But for now, it's just really nice to see that this team has figured out a style that theoretically works. Right, I'm not saying it's perfect, but it theoretically works. Yeah, no, I think some teams really have to start brainstorming on how they're going to deal with it. Uh, yeah. Because from a macro point of view, it's very difficult to counter a, a team that doesn't have a weak side. You cannot dive anyone. There's just no one there. They're just willing yes. to trade towers. Yes. Yes. So my, my personal solution was you have to pick a solo lane that is capable of killing towers way faster than enemies. So last sure. time we went into the Mad Lions game, I already had in my head, I want either Camille or Tristana on one of my side lanes. And we ended up getting the Tristana. Uh, yeah. Um, it also happened to be just a good matchup. And, you know, things have to fall in place. But yeah. I think that is one way to actually counter them is to have fast pushing side lanes like don't give them something like azir and try to get something like tristana on your own hand so you're the one that is usually going to get the tempo advantage and then can actually translate it to the objectives i like that and also tristana is a champion where you're probably going to be able to to contest a 25 minute um drake soul as well like that's not something where you're immediately giving up that kind of idea um yeah. and also i just want to say that was one of the better games that you guys have played um the control yeah. that expector mickey got on top side that game was really good for casual like that was actually one of the best kind of solo lane games from your players that that we'd actually seen the whole split i remember that game how would you guys um predict, expect, analyze the potential of Mad Lions in the playoffs. Oh, okay, let me just get all the playoffs. Bear in mind, obviously, one thing I should throw in here, just as a disclaimer, is they are still a team with mainly rookies. So obviously, you never know if rookies carry the form that they had in the split itself into the playoffs, or if they get nervous or any of that. So obviously, we're taking into account that it could be very variable. But based on what you saw in the split, how good should they be? I think... Fifth place is fair. It depends on where Misfits. Yeah. But what they do this week um, just seems like the other team's a little bit of a step ahead right now. Yeah, I think and Mad Lions. Yep, I, I think Mad Lions beat Misfits, and then um, versus Rogue, I think they can still beat Rogue, but it would be close. And then I think, I think they lose to Origin unless Origin's having like a particularly bad day. Um, I honestly, the origin one depends on the version of humanoid that steps up because he looks very uncomfortable early on in the split. He's looked a lot better as the split has gone on. And if he continues on that trajectory, maybe they actually have a shot versus origin. I don't see them beating Fnatic. I don't see them beating G2 in like any, any area. So top five, top four is probably where we're looking at them finishing. Uh, my assumption is that they do beat Misfits. I'm assuming Youngbuck's assumption is that they 100% beat Rogue, uh, which for me is a bit more of a flip. I would give it a 75-25 for Rogue right now. Okay, okay. This video was kindly supported by Alexander Rao, Dean Tanglis, Ho Chi Mao, J Dobbs, Nate D-O-double-G, Peter the Feeder, Tobias Bernasconi, and a special thanks always goes out to Jerky's Minion. Would you like to suggest a topic or a guest for my content? Perhaps you want to ask me a question in my monthly Patreon AMA. Do you want teasers for who the guests are on my upcoming content? Maybe you want to take a part in the patron discussion with me each month. Well, if any of these perks tickle your fancy, then put your money where your mouth is by joining the Skrilluminati today in the Patreon link in the description box below.